Well, Cycle 25 Hub Not Club, uh, welcome to another session. Um, and today I'm lucky to have George um, to give us a little conversation on DMR. Uh, what do I need to know, George? Thanks, Rod. Um, let's see, let me go ahead and share my screen. Let me know if you could see it. Yep. All Got right. It. So what prompted all of this is uh, in previous conversations, some folks were asking questions, some pretty basic stuff about DMR and how it works. So I thought it'd be good to do a little uh, introduction to DMR. And the, uh, the approach I wanted to take is, is more than just a glossy overview, but not go through all the internal workings that don't really matter if you just want to use your radio. So the whole, the spirit of this is like, what do you need to know just to get going and actually use, right. use the radio? So what prompted all of this? So there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of potential questions. For asking questions. I'm hearing an echo, Rod. Yeah, please somewhere. mute folks. So I thought it'd be good to do a uh, somebody that's watching on YouTube, DMR. please mute. And the uh, the approach I wanted to take is is more than just a glossy overview, but not go through all the internal workings. I'm desperately that meeting people don't really matter if you just want to use your radio. So the whole the spirit of this is like, what do you need to know? Just okay, that was John. There we go. Okay, okay, well we're done. good. I'll okay, edit good. that out. So as we're going through this, this is really intended for you guys to understand uh, how to operate and set up your radio. So if you have any questions, just ask as we go through it. So it's better than waiting till the very end. And of course, we'll take questions at, at the end. There's actually about 40 slides here. So there's a fair bit of material. It's very simple. It's only 40 slides. But I, I did take some concepts and really stretch it out uh, with illustrations to try to explain things. Um, also, I wanted to mention that a couple of the slides in the beginning I got from other people's presentations. And I, I should credit them, but I don't remember who they are. <laughs> but there's only one or two uh, that really came from someone else's presentation. So what I want to walk through here is uh, a quick, very quick intro to what is DMR and how is it different from the other digital modes we commonly use these days? How does it work? What are the networks um, that are out there? How do you program your radio? What's a hotspot? How do you use your radio? And then maybe some gear selection tips. So let's start with, uh, with like, what's the big deal? Why bother with digital radio at all? And everybody would pretty much imagine this list. Uh, the first advantage to digital, of course, is there's really no static. You're either in there or you're not. Uh, or in some systems, you might, um, you might wind up hearing modem tones and not the actual voice audio when things get noisy. But uh, you don't have sort of that gradual fade into the noise. Uh, you, you do get better voice quality under very noisy conditions, but uh, FM will always sound better when the signals are very strong. So it's really a fidelity uh, difference because the digital signals are much narrower band than the, uh, than the typical FM that we use. It's very easy to link these systems over the internet relative to uh, analog systems. You can do analog linking uh, RF point to point or over the internet but it's very easy to put these digital systems uh, on an internet or data network. You can send voice and data, and um, they're frankly much easier to set up than analog repeaters. And, and I've spent many decades building and installing and running analog repeaters. And I could tell you that setting up a, a digital repeater, at least a DMR repeater, is, is by far the easiest uh, that I've ever done. So I could see where folks that are new to repeaters would really appreciate this kind of an approach. So a little bit of uh, uh, background on each of these. Uh, D-STAR uh, was developed by the Japan Amateur Radio League, the JARL. The spec was originally released back in 2001. So it's been around for a long time and ICOM jumped on the bandwagon really early. And for many, many years, ICOM was the only supplier of D-STAR radios. And today they're still by far the leading supplier. Although you can get uh, D-STAR radios uh, from Kenwood. I think they might've just, uh, um, stop producing their, their D-Star compatible handy talkie, but you can also add D-Star to uh, flex radios as well. And our club has a uh, D-Star repeater here in the Bay Area. Yesu Fusion is developed by Yesu. Uh, they first came out with it in about 2014. Uh, only Yesu makes compatible equipment. And I would say it's a proprietary system Yesu's position is that they say it's open, but I don't understand what they mean by that because nobody else is building to the Yesu standard. Um, not that it necessarily matters a whole lot. And then DMR is, is quite different. DMR is actually not a vendor. Uh, DMR is an Etsy standard. So Etsy is the European Telecommunications Standards 
Institute or whatever. And so they defined the uh, DMR standard, the first tier one standard back in 2005. And there is a, a large number of vendors that make DMR compatible gear. Uh, all the big commercial vendors, Motorola, Hytera, and a zillion Chinese vendors uh, make, make DMR compatible uh, radios. So it started out being a European standard and has moved into North America in a really big way. And, and our club runs uh, one of each of these. So we have real on the ground experience uh, as repeater owner administrators, as well as users on all three of these systems now for, for many, many years. And so some of the opinions that I'm gonna share with you are based on my observations of using and running these systems. Um, just one of the questions that comes up a lot is which is gonna win? <laughs> so it's one of those questions for which the answer is, um, there isn't gonna be a winner in my opinion for many, many years, there may never be. Uh, I think what you're going to find is that uh, the ICOM continues to come out with more and more D-Star radios. So, so ICOM is thoroughly behind their D-Star uh, systems. Yesu is 100% behind their fusion systems. And everybody else making commercial radios don't do those because they're making commercial radios, so they make DMR. If you want to get some fun statistics, if you go to repeater book website, and look at the number of repeaters in each mode, what you'll see is back in 2018, when I did this uh, analysis the first time, there were about uh, 1,200 D-Star repeaters, 1,600 Fusion repeaters, and 1,400 DMR repeaters uh, in North America. So that's uh, Mexico, US, and Canada. Um, if you look in 2021, for this presentation, I went back and looked at the numbers. D-Star has gone up very slightly, 4%. Uh, Fusion has gone up 15% over the last couple of years, and DMR has gone up 35%. And if you look at the absolute numbers, the uh, the current leader is Yesu, but only by a hair. So the number of North America DMR repeaters is uh, virtually in a dead heat with Fusion, and the growth rate favors DMR. Um, a lot of and people. George, yeah. what's what's driving that? Because I mean, didn't Yesu put a lot of those into market? In a really attractive program? Yeah, so when Yesu came out, Yesu did, in my opinion, something really right and something really wrong. So what they did really right was they bombed the price when they entered the market. So when Yesu started up, they were giving away repeaters. Uh, if you applied as a club, uh, they would give you one for free. And ultimately, you could buy the repeater for $500, which is just a phenomenal price uh, for a repeater. Now, that repeater should be selling for $1,500 or more. And so they were really giving huge price incentives, which is, of course, the right thing to do. If I were them, I'd do the same thing. And what you found was some people adopted it to use the digital mode. And a lot of people bought them because they're dual analog digital. And they could take their aging old 25-year-old analog repeater, chuck it in the trash, and for free or 500 bucks, replace it with a fusion repeater and only use it in analog mode. And uh, they would be the winner <laughs> in that deal. Um, and of course, th there is a lot of, uh, of fusion digital operation as well. I don't mean to, to suggest there isn't, but uh, you really can't tell when you look at 1900 fusion repeaters, how many are purely on analog or digital or mixed, uh, it's unclear. Uh, you, you just don't know, um, but it, it's definitely popular. I mean, there's a, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of it people on all three of these modes. As of today, even though there's more interest in DMR, I think largely because, um, well, several reasons we'll get to in a minute, uh, largely because of the inexpensive and high-quality commercial radios you can get for that for that mode, um, it's really a three-horse race, in my opinion. Um, I think in the in ICOM's uh, favor, every new radio, including the 705, has has D-Star. All the ASU radios have Fusion, <laughs> so nobody's letting up off the gas. I think they're all pushing their standards standards, quote unquote. Um, if I had to pick one. There's a variety of criteria I would use to pick one which is best, but for, from a practical point of view, the best advice I would give anybody is pick the one that your friends use because they all have pros and cons. None of them are perfect, and we'll talk a bit about the differences. So if everybody in your club uses Fusion or DMR, I just use whatever they use and go from there. And a lot of us have multiple radios. I've, I've got one of every one, of course. Uh, so. So that may be in your future. You can kind of think about them almost as different bands uh, that you can operate. But you, you really do see the growth in DMR is really uh, higher than the others. So uh, what's the same? If you look at all of these different systems, what's common to all of them? 
Uh, they all have a very large and growing user base. I think the number of digital repeaters is greatly outstripping the number of new analog repeaters. And while it's still a minority of repeaters in North America, something under 20%, I, I would imagine in the next 10 to 20 years, it'll probably be 70 or 80% will be digital. There'll always be FM repeaters. They'll never go away. But I think you'll start to see uh, more and more uh, digital becoming very common. Uh, the, they all can be used as repeaters. You can all use these modes as simplex. We'll talk about the usage cases. Uh, they all use uh, some form of linking over the internet to connect the, the, the systems together easily. They all have a notion of a conference bridge, whether you call it a reflector, a room, a talk group, or whatever. The notion is a is a place where you can hub multiple repeaters together, and they all support hotspots. So it, to some degree, the basic uh, use case of these systems is, is the same. Where you start to see some differences is um, when you really examine how each of these systems work. Now, this is my personal opinion. Your opinion may vary for good reason, but I try to compare a little bit technically and a little bit um, subjectively the differences between these. The ones that I put with green uh, color coding here are the ones that in my opinion are really the best in that particular dimension of the, of the system. So if you look at it from a HAMS perspective, DSTAR and Fusion really get the edge over DMR because these systems are designed for HAM radio. So they work very naturally the way a HAM wants to work. Whereas the DMR systems were not designed for hams, they're designed for commercial users. And once you wrap your head around this fact, then a lot of the weird behavior of DMR makes sense. So uh, to give you an example on the Fusion or D-Star systems, when you configure your radio properly to talk uh, to each other through a repeater or over the internet, everybody can hear what's going on. And those connections are established and remain connected until you disconnect them. In the case of DMR, the way the talk groups work, and we'll get into this in a few minutes, when you transmit a talk group, you can switch the connection on the internet to a different destination. And everybody that keys up with a different code will switch the destination when they key up. And so you're constantly switching connections around, which makes no sense from a ham radio perspective. But if you're the city of San Jose and you wanna put the dog catchers on one talk group and the trash collectors on a different talk group, it makes perfect sense. So it's, it's just a different use case and we're adapting to the way commercial users would use a system when we use DMR. All of the ham radios are front panel programmable, which means that you can set the configuration through the keypad. Traditional DMR commercial radios, there's no front panel programmability. There's a lot of exceptions to some things I'm gonna to say today, like you can find uh, a handful of different radio models today in DMR where you can do some degree of front panel programming, but that's because somebody came out with a custom piece of firmware or a radio was very specifically uh, designed for the ham market. But for the most part, they're not because you don't want the, the dog catcher to change the frequency <laughs> on channel three of his radio. So that's not permitted in the commercial world. In the uh, Yesu and the uh, D-Star world, on a single RF carrier, you get one channel. So this is, why would we even say this? Because it's, of course it's always one channel, like in an FM repeater. Well, in DMR, they use a time division multiple access or TDMA uh, uh, approach, which gives you essentially two time slots, which allows you to have two simultaneous channels, if you will, multiplexed on one RF carrier. So you get two discrete voice channels uh, on a single repeater, which is a big advantage. Uh, from a radio quality perspective, D-Star and Yesu radios are ham radios. These are, um, you know, radios from ICOM and Yesu. They make fantastic radios, but they're not meant to be used by, um, you know, the search and rescue team or the ambulance guys or whatever. They're meant to be used by consumers, whereas the DMR radios are built for commercial uh, use. And so they tend to be more rugged and more reliable. Um, anyway, you can kind of roll down the list here. Uh, ultimately... Uh, there, there's no one system that's perfect. And they, they really do all have trade-offs. And I think that's one reason why you'll see ICOM, Yesu, and DMR all continue to be very popular uh, for the next 10 years, if not you know, forever, because uh, you know, some people prefer one over the other and they're not wrong. It just depends on what you like. Okay, so, so that's kind of a little bit of a difference. We can spend all day debating it. For my, my personal opinion, is that I like aspects of all three of these, frankly. Um, 
I personally tend to use DMR the most and DSTAR probably second. Uh, although actually FM probably really uh, first or second. Uh, but from a digital perspective, I kind of prefer DMR and I'll, I'll kind of get into why. But um, let's talk a little bit about how it works. And this is something I think is really in a way the most important thing to, uh, to, to think about. Um, what I'm showing you on this slide, you can summarily forget after you see this slide. So it's just for your entertainment. Um, if you look at each of these systems, they do all use different fundamental technology, which is why they are inherently not interoperable. So uh, DSTAR, Fusion, and DMR um, have different technical signaling systems. So that's why you can't just have these radios talk to each other. Uh, they all use what's called a vocoder. A vocoder is a, is a device. It's a, it's a chip that takes your analog audio and codes it into a digital stream and then decodes that and recovers the analog audio. The, um, the, the vocoders that are used are all produced by a company called DVSI. And DVSI makes um, the chips and or the software version of the vocoder. Um, and it's, it's called AMBE, A-M-B-E. The AMBE vocoders are designed to take a voice band audio stream and code it into a very small number of bits in order to get into a very narrow RF channel. So if you compare this to, uh, let's say, voice over IP, like when we do Skype or Zoom, we're using um, codecs that are probably signaling at 32 kilobits a second or 64 kilobits a second. Over the radio, we're talking about sending uh, somewhere between 2,400 to 4,800 bits per second. So in order to, to compress the, the voice band audio, you need a very clever codec. And so these DVSI codecs do that. And those are not free. You have to buy the chip or you have to license the software. But all of them use that, uh, a, a derivative of that particular of vocoder. The modulation techniques are all different between all three. The multiplexing is different. The data rates are different. The bandwidth is, is kind of different depending on the vendor. So. All of these reasons are, are fundamental reasons why the systems are incompatible. And that doesn't even go up the signaling stack into the net, network routing and all that. Those are all different that again. So um, this is why it's kind of the physical layer. They're really, they're really all very different things. Conceptually the same, but the implementations are different. Uh, when you look at this from a bandwidth perspective, I think this is kind of an interesting uh, uh, thing to ponder here. One of the advantages of digital is it takes up less bandwidth and everybody does it differently. DSTAR uses a, a 6.25 kilohertz narrow bandwidth with a single voice channel. So that means you can pack more DSTAR signals in the band, twice as many as uh, a typical, uh, well, arguably four times as many as a typical FM uh, channel. DMR uses a 12 and a half kilohertz wide signal, but they, uh, they have two time slots. And so each conversation or each channel happens every other time slot. And so you effectively get the same throughput. When the FCC mandated narrow banding in the commercial world, um, they made everybody go from 25 kilohertz FM channels to 12 and a half uh, kilohertz FM channels and even, even narrower. One way to do that is to just make your FM modulation much narrower, which kind of reduces the fidelity. Uh, in the digital world, you can get away with the same thing by having a single voice channel that's narrow or two voice channels and it's wider. You get the same throughput and both are considered narrow band solutions. Fusion has a single voice channel, but they have two modes. They have a narrow band and a wide band uh, version. The narrow band lets you send data and the wide band is voice only. Uh, and the fidelity is, is theoretically best in the Yesu wide band mode, but it's rarely used from what I've seen. The other thing that's interesting to see is, is how does the, the, when you transmit data, by the way, all this stuff I'm going through, you can completely forget when we're done with it because it makes no difference for operating your radio, but it's kind of interesting background. Mm -hmm. um, when you transmit, you're essentially transmitting a data stream and each of these systems works a little bit differently. Um, when you transmit on DSTAR, they send a 600 bit header, which includes a bunch of digital control information and then voice, uh, digitized voice data after that for the remainder of the transmission. Yesu does some interleaving between voice and data and in DMR, uh, they send a synchronization packet or set of packets, then, then alternating slot one, slot two voice packets, then another synchronizing packet and then voice. So um, this is the first point where I would assert why DMR is superior technically. By the way, this is not the reason to go DMR and not go DSTAR or Fusion. However, 
Uh, one reason DMR is a more robust system is because they resynchronize constantly. Uh, in in, in uh, DSTAR, when you press the button and you send your, your 600 bits of routing information, if you if, if somehow your signal, um, that 600 bits doesn't go through, the rest of your signal is, is not useful. With DMR, it's constantly resynchronizing and sending the control data. So it's a more robust protocol. Uh, okay, so I, I wanna touch on this from, from a repeater owner's perspective. So if you don't own a repeater, you really don't care. However, if you're contemplating putting up and running a digital repeater, these are some things for you to think about. Um, it, it, I've personally installed and have run all three of these systems. Honestly, I'm not, I, I, I feel pretty expert on the DSTAR and DMR side, not so much on Fusion. Um, uh, David K6ZHD in our club is Mr. Fusion. He knows way more than I do, but so this is partly my observation for Fusion. Um, they all work. They all work fine. I wouldn't shy away from any of them. So to the first order, they're all fine. However, DSTAR and Yesu radios, they're ham radios. If you open the box, there's two mobile radios bolted in the box and some control logic. And they're, they're, no, more, uh, they're no better than the mobile radio you buy uh, as a consumer. So they are adequate, but they're not really highly reliable and robust radios. If you take apart a Motorola DMR repeater, it's a completely different world. The quality of the construction, the heat dissipation, the RF shielding, the quality of the components is head and shoulders better than DSTAR and Yesu. What difference does that make to you as a user? It doesn't. But as a repeater owner, they're going to be much more reliable. It's just, it's just a fact. Um, a DSTAR system will take two to three rack units of space, maybe, maybe, may or may not make a difference. Uh, a Yesu system will take three rack units of space, assuming, by the way, the computer, you need an outboard computer to network them. And assuming that computer fits in a one use slot, um, th these are the smallest footprints you can get away with. With a DMR repeater, if you use the current Motorola uh, 55 or 5700 series, which we run, it's one U. And that does not require a computer, it's, it's all built in. The, um, all of the units are pretty easy to set up. Uh, I would say Yesu and DMR are easier than DSTAR, but it's, it's not awful. Um, they all require external power, except the DMR repeater. You can run with internal power supply if you like. The, the only downside here is the DMR repeater is to be more expensive. They're, they list price, a brand new one out of the box is about three grand, $3,200. If you shop around and find a ham-friendly dealer, you can get them for somewhere between two and $3,000 brand new, uh, or you can buy them used for under $1,000. The uh, Yesu and DSTAR, when they are running their promotions are 500 bucks, which is a swing and deal. Uh, you need two modules for DSTAR in the past. I think they're consolidating that to one. So, um, so it would be a bit more expensive to buy into DMR if you go down the Motorola route, which is what I'd recommend. But also remember you have a two slot system, meaning that when you put up your DMR repeater, you're effectively getting two repeaters for the price of one. So in my mind, this is the second enormous advantage of DMR from a repeater system perspective. So if I were a club for the cost and effort to install one DMR repeater, I'm essentially getting two UHF repeaters in one. So I can have two completely isolated conversations or connections going on with the DMR repeater. Whereas with Yesu and DSTAR, I only have one. So, um, that's just kind of a little bit of, of kind of system background. So uh, if you want to talk about any of that stuff, we can go back. Are there any questions before we get into um, the next section? George? Yes. Uh, you said uh, there was something Yesu did really well and really bad. What was the really bad? Uh, <laughs> well, the two things I think are subpar. Number one is the hardware quality is, is okay, not great. So if I were going to put a repeater on a snowy mountaintop and that I didn't have access to for eight months out of the year, I would be concerned. I would not be concerned with a Motorola radio, relatively speaking. The second thing is the controllers inside the Fusion radios are really awful. Crap. Now, what I mean, let, let, me, let me tell you the experience that we've had. We, we had the first DR1, the, the very first units. We've replaced that with a DR1X. And so we've, we've run 
the first two generations of DMR repeaters. To this day, and we've been running these things for about four years. To this day, about once a month, the repeater gets stuck on transmit. Now, the reason it gets stuck in transmit is because of some signaling bug where you're on group monitor or you're doing just some normal operation on the repeater and it just gets stuck in transmit. And this didn't happen once. This, is ha this has happened so many times. We installed a remotely controllable power switch on the power supply that goes to the repeater and another one on the computer that is running the internet connection. <laughs> and it's almost never the, the, the uh, computer. In fact, I don't think it's ever been the computer, but it has been the repeater. So the repeater reliably gets stuck in transmit once a month and we have to power cycle the thing to bring it back up. And um, so for that reason alone, you know, uh, unless you're willing to put in control systems around the system, it's, it's just not good. To, to further comment on George, I own the repeater in the CN tower and we have a Christmas tree timer on it because we don't have internet access up there that go every six hours, it just power cycles just in case. Yeah, that's a great idea, Mike. I, I would absolutely do that. I mean, it, even on the very latest, you know, maybe the very latest one is better. I think the number of failures has gone down as they went from the first to the second generation and probably now the third. Um, and, and, I, and I was in contact with the ASU folks on day one explaining everything and they never responded. So as far as I know, I'm sure they realize they have problems, but they didn't want to admit it. So reliability wise, I would put Yesu at the bottom of the barrel. Uh, I would say our D-Star systems, we've been running D-Star for 10 years. And um, I think I would say that the systems, we've, we've never had that kind of hang up. We have had to reboot them once in a blue moon, maybe once every couple of years, they've had to be rebooted. Um, the biggest issue we've had with the D-Star repeaters is I've gone through two UHF modules where the uh, PA in the transmitter burned up. Um, so we're getting, we, we have about a one in once every five year burnout <laughs> because we've gone through two and we're, we're on our third. Now I will give ICOM credit that when we shipped our two burned up repeater modules to, to ICOM, they repaired them and their repair fees were very reasonable. One of them cost hundred dollars to fix and the other one was about $200 to fix. And so, and their turnaround was reasonably fast and, and their service was very good. So, so I'll say that, you know, that in terms of service, I think they were great. Um, but the quality and reliability is, is, is not as good as a commercial repeater. It just isn't. By the way, um, it, here's a little tidbit. When we cracked open the, the uh, ICOM repeater to, to look at, figure out what the problem was, between the radio and the back of the panel is a little coax pigtail. And they use RG58 coax. So, you know, anybody that builds repeaters that puts them in high RF sites knows you don't use coax. You don't use normal coax for this sort of thing. Uh, now, granted, it was in a box, so you can argue the box is shielded, but you still have a receiver and transmitter with, with RG58 coax. And you, you don't want to be running that stuff in a repeater. You want to use double shielded silver good RG142 or something like that. So we ripped out the coax and put in RG142 to get better shielding. So it's just little things like this that is, you know, you compare that to the, what's inside of a, of a uh, Motorola DMR repeater. There's just no comparison. Okay. Uh, any other questions before we get into the useful stuff? Just remind everybody you can, tell, you can forget everything he just told you. Yeah, that's right. As a user, that's all just interesting. <laughs> okay. <laughs> hey, let's get to the good stuff. Now, let's get to the good stuff. So first of all, in DMR, you need to have a radio ID. Okay. The way the system works is there's a, 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 a code number that's up to eight digits that is used for a whole bunch of purposes. And in the universe, everybody gets a unique number. So as long as we don't go over whatever that is, 10 million hams, we're probably pretty good. Um, now, what you'll see is, is th these things in, in, um, uh, in, in the ham radio world, the first thing is you got to go to radioid.net and register yourself. So you just fill out a little form and you'll get assigned a seven digit number. This is your personal radio ID number. This is the number you'll program into all of your radios. Now, why do you have to do this? In D-Star Infusion, they are built for ham radio, so your ID is your call sign. In the DMR world, they don't know what a call sign is. They don't, they don't care. 
what they care about is that there's a fleet of users and everyone has a number, like a phone number. And so your ID is a number. So um, when you transmit, your ID number is sent and that's how the other station knows who you are. So there, these numbers are used for different purposes. And the way the uh, sort of gentleman's agreement is set up, the shorter numbers are used for more system oriented things and the longer numbers are used for individual users. So you'll see one and two digit uh, ID numbers uh, like two or 91 that are used for local chat or for international talk group. I'll talk about what those mean in a few minutes. Um, typical talk groups are three, four and five digits. Uh, repeaters have six digits and users have seven digits. You can kind of think about this as like the smaller number, just think about them as padded with zeros in front of it, but we never put the zeros in. So it's like talk group 91 is probably 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 91, but you don't put in the zeros. It's just talk group 91. So that's kind of how it all makes sense in one massive table. So we'll talk about how these IDs are used in a minute, but uh, everybody gets a user ID. My user ID is 1106405. It's not very personal, but that's my number. Okay, it doesn't cost you anything. Get yourself a number and then you can start using the system. Now, by the way, if you don't put in your personal number and you program your radio and you just put in some random number, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, it will work, but nobody knows who you are. And that's just kind of not polite. So you really do want to get your number and, and, and use the number. So let's, let's get into some lingo here. So I think DMR... At the, at the core of it is no more complicated than D-Star. Um, it, it's, it's very similar. You need to know a handful of things. We'll talk about those in the next couple slides. The thing that's really difficult about DMR, there's really two things. One is the terminology is very confusing. And secondly, not every vendor uses the same terminology, which makes it doubly confusing. Oh, and one more thing too is when you go to program your radio, you only need to program a small subset of features to make it work. But those radios do so many things, a lot of the features that they show you, you'll never ever use because hams don't use a lot of those features. But it's confusing because you see, you know, 30 different things you can configure of which five are relevant. The trick is knowing which five. Once you know which five, it's actually very easy and you just ignore the rest of it. So that's what we, we kind of want to get through today. So let's talk about some terminology. The first thing you'll hear constantly is this term code plug. Do you have a code plug? <laughs> I'm, I'm building my code plug. What the heck is a code plug? So a code plug is nothing more than a file which contains the configuration of your memories and some system-wide features of your radio. That's all it is. Why is it called a code plug? Uh, I'm sure Mike knows the reason and a few of you others. Um, Mike does not know, I'm shocked. So, so the terminology of, of code plug goes back like 40 years ago. So when- Oh, I know why, yes. When two-way radios in the commercial world went from crystals or channel elements to be software uh, programmable, what they would do is they would, uh, they would program an EEPROM and you would put in the EEPROM the frequencies for every channel. And you would literally plug the EEPROM into your radio. And that was the code plug. It was a physical thing you would plug into your, your radio. And now your 16 channel radio would look in the EEPROM for what the frequencies were to tell the synthesizer what frequency to go to. Well, code plugs went from being physical things to electrically programmable EEPROMs um, where you just, hook up your computer to the radio and you download the, the configuration data through the interface and it would program the channel information into the programmable memory. So that's the way they all are today. However, we still use the term code plug. So the code plug is nothing more than a file that says, okay, channel one is this frequency, channel two is that frequency. When I turn on the radio, the screen says my call sign. Uh, all that stuff goes in the code plug. So if I said, Rod, uh, give me your code plug for your radio, he would give me a file with his channel information that I could then load into my software and edit and then load into my radio and, and use it. So that's all that is. Okay, let's talk about a talk group. What's a talk group? Talk group is DMR lingo for a, um, a, a, a ID that users share to be able to talk to each other. 
So for two radios to talk to each other in DMR, they have to have the talk group number set to be the same number. We'll, we'll go through this in some more detail. So just think about it as analogous to in D-Star, a, a reflector or a room in uh, Fusion, a talk group is the, is the hub uh, on the internet where multiple repeaters connect, or it's a code that you transmit between two simplex stations, which have to be set to be the same code, or they won't be able to talk to each other. Um, so talk groups are very, very important because that's how you, you point your, your hotspot or your repeater to different uh, other repeaters or groups on the internet. Time slot. We talked about time slots already. Think about it this way, that, that on every repeater, you have two time slots and it's one of the parameters you have to set. Am I going into time slot one or am I going into time slot two? And again, these are two completely independent and simultaneous channels that operate on the repeater magically at the same time. Color code. <laughs> This is another is one cool. where the name is completely nutty. Um, you can think about color code, the analogy to color code in the analog world is it's kind of like a PL tone. What, what is color code? One of the reasons why, by the way, DMR is better in my opinion than the other digital modes is neither one of Fusion or D-Star has the same notion. If, you, if we're in the Bay Area and we have two repeaters, one in the North Bay, one in the South Bay, and they're on the same frequency, in the analog world, the way that we choose which frequent, which repeater we key up is by having a different PL tone. Okay, that's pretty basic. In the DM, in the in the D star world, there's if you have two repeaters in the same repeat, uh, frequency, you're screwed because you're going to key up both of them. In, in, in well, unless you set one of the, the repeat frequencies uh, or fields. In Yesu, you don't have a way to discriminate. In the DMR world, you can set your repeaters to have different color codes. The, the color code is a number between zero and 15. It's just an additional piece of data that's transmitted to the other station or the other or the repeater that grants you access to that system. They just have to match up. So for example, uh, our DMR repeater here requires a color code of one. So you just have to set that field. Okay, so we'll talk more about, about how you set that stuff. Uh, zone. In ham radio lingo, a zone is a memory bank. So you can think about your radio as having one or more memory banks and you, you put sets of channels in each memory bank for some convenient reason. So for example, you might say, when I'm in the Bay Area, zone one is Bay Area repeaters, zone two is uh, repeaters in New York, zone three is repeaters in uh, London. Or you might say, zone one is my favorite ham repeaters, zone two is public safety receive only channels or whatever, however you wanna organize it. Zones just means memory bank and every DMR radio has multiple zones or multiple memory banks. You know what the radio yes. ID is? Yeah, go if ahead, I could just add, add the one thing with zones. What's nice is with zones, a memory can reside in more than one zone. Yeah, exactly. Uh, if, so that's a distinction different than some of the other radios. So. Yeah, that's a good point. So, so you set up your, your, list of of mem you, your list of channels is one table and your zones is a different table. And to John's point, any of the channels can be in any of the zones in any combination you like. Um, we talked about radio ID. The last thing is the term contact. Um, contact is the is a table. The, the contact table is a table of user IDs or talk group IDs. Um, and we'll, you'll, you'll see an example of that in a minute. But the word contact list, it, you'll see it's it's it makes sense in one way, but not in another way that we'll, we'll talk about. Okay, so, so let, me, let me take all these terms and let's look at it from a practical point of view. Um, when you go to configure your radio, let's start with an analog FM radio. If you're configuring an FM radio, um, how terribly complicated is that? There's not much you have to do. You have to set the receive frequency, you have to set the transmit offset, and you probably have to set a PL tone. Now, if you're, if you're operating simplex, you set the, the same frequency with your buddy, and that's it, right? 14652, you set it for that, that's all you need to do, and you're talking to each other, that, that's great. You go into a repeater, you, you set your repeater frequency and then the offset. And if it's a carrier operated repeater, you're in the repeater, no problem. If the repeater needs a PL, you have to turn on the PL tone and code and now you can get into the repeater. So everybody knows that stuff, that's, that's basic stuff. Now for a DMR radio, there is a different set of things you have to set, but it's frankly not much more complicated than this. And this is where um, I think a lot of the, um, a lot of the, the bad rap about DMR is, oh my God, it's so complicated. It's not that complicated. Okay, it's, if you understand what I'm about to show you, this is the single most useful slide in the whole presentation. 
Forget everything else, just remember this slide. Thank you, Rod. Um, what do you need to set? Okay, for every channel, I need to set my receive and transmit frequency. You're already doing that in, in FM, right? You've got that figured out. There is no PL tone. However, there are some digital configuration fields you have to set. And there's three things you have to set. This is the most important thing to remember. You have to set the time slot, you have to set the color code, and you have to set the talk group. Those are the three fields that you have to set. Time slot is either one or two. <laughs> it's only have two choices, time slot one or time slot two. Color code is a number from zero to 15. And talk group is a number between zero and 9999999. Once you set those three fields and the frequency, you're done. That is all you have to set, okay? Now, we'll go into some examples here uh, of what that looks like. But this is, the, this is really important. Just to get through your head, this, is, this ain't that complicated. If you can set those three fields with those numbers, you're good to go. All right, so let's take a look at, at uh, how this operates. So let's, let's take a look at the scenario here. I've got uh, three users. Um, on the person on the left, their radio is configured for 433.8 megahertz simplex. The radios on the right are also 433.8 megahertz simplex. If this were FM, we'd be talking to each other. Everything would work fine. If I'm talking simplex between these three users, can anybody tell me why this user number three won't hear anything? This, this is the interactive part. Talk group, talk group number wrong is wrong. Talk group. Yeah. Correct. The talk groups are wrong. So user number one on the left and user number two on the right, upper right, their configuration is identical. Time slot one, talk group 310, color code one, all of those line up. So those guys are gonna talk simplex to each other, no problem. User number three, his talk group is set for 91. What happens is his radio will hear the RF carrier and it'll look at the data and say, time slot one, yep. Color code one, yep. Talk group, not 91, forget it, ignore it. Pretend like there's nothing there. What he'll see is the busy light on the, the radio will blink to show that there's activity on the channel, but they won't hear anything. So in order for them to be able to talk to the other stations, user number three would have to change their talk group to, uh, to 310. As soon as that person does it, now everybody's talking to everybody, simplex. Now, quick caveat, what I'm about to describe here and for the next several slides is the way the Etsy standard works and the way a commercial radio like a Motorola radio works. As with many things, there are exceptions to that rule. So there are some DMR radios like the, the famous Anytone 878 that has some additional features that allow you to monitor multiple talk groups at the same time. That is not part of the standard. That's a hack that the Anytone people put into their 878 to make it more appealing to hams. And it's a great feature to have because that way you can listen to your repeater and regardless of what talk group that repeater is on, you can hear all the traffic. The problem with that is you only can have one talk group programmed to transmit at a time. So if you're, if you're listening to the repeater and you hear traffic coming in on talk group 91, but you're set to transmit on 310, you'll hear it. But when you press the pickle, you're going to transmit 310. And by the way, you're going to switch the repeater to 310 all of a sudden and screw up the guy who's listening on 91. So if, if I, I'm only saying that because there are exceptions to many of the things I'm going to say. So I'm just going to tell you the way the base radios work. And, and if you follow my suggestions, it'll work fine. But your radio may have various features that are uh, a little bit uh, more advanced. Okay, does that make sense to everybody? Uh, okay, let's talk a little bit about networks. So we can't have one network, that would be too easy. <laughs> so hams being the creative lot that they are, have come up with multiple different networks for, for DMR. The first DMR network used by hams was called DMR Mark. Mark stands for Motorola Amateur Radio Club, not surprising. They were the first DMR backbone. Uh, they use a system called Seabridge and Seabridge originally was a piece of hardware and later on was implemented as software, which provides the connectivity between repeaters. So the way that, that you link repeaters in the DMR world, uh, like Fusion and, and DSTAR, is you do it over IP. So on the back of the radio is a RJ45 jack uh, for TCP, 
TCP connection to a network. Now that network could be the public internet, that network could be a private data network or whatever, but it's a TCP IP connection to go into a network, um, which is one reason why these are so easy to set up. So the networking is nothing more than if I can haul internet access to my repeater site, I can be on the network and you connect over IP. If you wanna build a, a private reliable network but that doesn't require the internet, you can build your own TCP IP RF backbone network using ubiquity radios or whatever you want. And you could run all of your IP traffic over your own private RF network, which is kind of a cool idea if you really wanna harden your system and you're local. But the advantage of the internet version of this is obviously I can connect my DMR repeater to anybody in the world. So that's a, that's a pretty useful feature. So Seabridge, is, is the first DMR network. Um, what happened about, I'd say about halfway, you know, ten, uh, five, six years ago is, is a bunch of hams are like, we don't like the way Seabridge works. We're gonna build our own DMR network. And that turned into what's called the Brandmeister network, which is currently probably the biggest network in the world. And that became the new hot thing. And then in the last couple of years, there's like 10 other splinter, smaller DMR networks so as a new user, my advice is just pay attention to Brandmeister because it's the biggest network and it's the most user-friendly network. So for the sake of today's uh, discussion, we're gonna forget the other ones. Um, I'll tell you one of the differences that you might wanna understand, how, as, however, as a user, one of the fundamental differences between the DMR Mark network and the Brandmeister network is uh, who controls the network connectivity. In the, uh, in the DMR Mark world, in the Seabridge world, as a system administrator, when I set up my repeater, I define which talk groups the users can use. So out of the, I don't know, 3,000, 10, whatever, 1,000 talk groups that exist, I will decide what collection of 2, 5, 10, 20, whatever talk groups you, the users, will be ever allowed to use. And I will program them into my repeater or into the network, into the Seabridge, and you can only ever connect to those 10 talk groups. The Brandmeister approach is exactly the opposite. The Brandmeister approach, the owner of the repeater system cannot control what talk groups the user selects. The user can point the repeater to any talk group in the entire network. So these are two extremes. Uh, I would prefer something in the middle as a repeater owner, but that's kind of the way it is. So we opted to go down the Brandmeister approach because um, it was much more powerful for our users. So, um, the reason I mention all this is because if you want to talk to somebody, let's say, you know, your friend Bob is in uh, is in Chicago, and you say, "Hey, Bob, let's talk on brand. Uh, let's talk on DMR." The first question is, "Okay, well, what repeater are you going to go into? Is that repeater on the Brandmeister network, or is it on the DMR Mark network, or a, perhaps a different network?" If you're not on the same network, there's a good chance you can't talk to each other. So if you're, uh, your local repeater's on Brandmeister, the other guy's repeater should be on the Brandmeister network uh, or use a hotspot. We'll get to hotspots later. So, uh, so that's why we, we prefer from a user perspective, the, the Brandmeister uh, approach. And, and George, in terms of ratios there, you said that Brandmeister, Brandmeister's the largest and, and then you've got DMR Mark and then you've got like everybody else. So I imagine the everybody else are, are quite small networks. Um, how, what's the ratio of Mark versus Brandmeister? Is it uh, close to a horse race or is it like way I, I don't know the numbers. I, I don't really have a good source for the numbers. Maybe we can figure that out somehow. If I had to take a wild guess, I would say Brandmeister is probably more than half. So it, it's, it's, it's the most likely place you're going to find the connectivity you're looking for. As a new okay. user, you can't go wrong with Brandmeister. You may find that there's a, a group you want to talk to that's on one of the other networks. And if you have a hotspot, you can connect to those networks. It's no big deal. But your local repeater is set up for one of these networks and usually only one. Um, it is possible to bridge the networks, but that has to be done by a special system administration function of the network operator as a special request. Um, so for example, um, uh, let me give you an example here. So in, in our system, uh, in, in Baynet, the way we set it up, we're on Brandmeister. Uh, our repeater has two times slots, of course. Um, we, we set up by uh, convention, by rules, not by any technical constraint, 
that we say time slot one, and this is a policy, this is not a technical thing. Our policy is that as a user, you can go into time slot one and you can connect to anything. You can connect, you can have a local conversation on the repeater, or you can connect over the internet to any Brandmeister uh, repeater or talk group. Uh, go for it. We, we don't constrain you at all. Time slot two, however, we say is strictly exclusively reserved for uh, Baynet, uh, the Baynet talk group, which is 31075. And, and if you go into the time slot two, you can actually point it to something else. But that's really like the gentleman's agreement is don't do that. That's what time slot one is for. Time slot two is just for, because that's like our system, you know, and, and, and we always want to find our club members or our extended family of club members who are out of the area or friends or whatever on 31075. So we always want to be on that talk group. That's our policy. Other, other Brandmeister repeaters have different approaches. They say things like, well, time slot one could be for regional use and time slot two for international use or like whatever you want to do. Uh, that's just our approach. If you compare this to, a, 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 I have friends who run a system called the Western States DMR network. That system has got like 15 repeaters in it. On that system, that's in a DMR, that's in a Seabridge network, a DMR mark type Seabridge network. They can only connect to their own 15 repeaters. They don't connect to anything outside of their network. So it's their own clubs network. And if you look at their uh, talk groups, they explicitly list out on the website which talk groups you can access. And so you have to program your radio to this combination and nothing else because this is all you can do. So on time slot, uh, time slot one, there's about 15 channels. Time slot two, there's about four or talk groups and there's four on time slot two. Uh, this is it. This is your universe of available connections. That's it, period, full stop. Brandmeister, you can put it wherever you want it. Now, some people, if you're building a, here's my kind of summary takeaway. If you're building a private repeater system and you only want to talk to yourself, then Seabridge is the way to go because you can control everything. If you want to build an open repeater that anybody can use for whatever they want, then go with Brandmeister. So that's kind of the general approach. You'll even notice here there is an exception. So uh, since these are friends of ours, uh, we wanted to be able to bridge our, our Brandmeister with their Seabridge. And so you'll notice if you look at um, their Seabridge uh, talk group list, down the list there, you'll see Baynet 31075. That's actually a Brandmeister talk group connected from a Seabridge. So we worked with the Brandmeister network people to make this special exception. So we can actually bridge, but this is not a general bridge. This is explicitly only between our, our talk group and their, uh, their Seabridge network. So these things can happen, but, they're, but they do require extra work. So anyway, the reason I tell you all this as a user is you might say, well, hang on. My buddy Bob in Florida is going into his DMR repeater and I'm going into our DMR repeater and we can't seem to talk. Well, maybe that's because he's on a Seabridge system, not on a Brandmeister system. So think about it like if ATT, Verizon and Sprint cell networks didn't intercommunicate. If you're all on ATT, life is good, but your buddy that's on Verizon, you'll never talk to him. And that's kind of the way this is. So as a new user or even as a, as a frequent user over many years, uh, my advice is stick with Brandmeister to maximize your options unless you have some reason to go elsewhere. Okay, let's talk about programming your radio. Now the really useful stuff. Well, that's daunting. <laughs> so if you go into the programming software for your Anytone 878, which is you know, a very, very popular radio, um, if you look at the programming uh, software, on the left-hand side, you'll see about 20 different uh, uh, tables that you can go into to configure your radio. I, I mentioned early on, there's only a few things you need to ever do, and you could ignore about three quarters of it. If you look down the left there, I've highlighted all of the different parts of the programming software that you probably need to do something with, and I've scratched out all the ones you can summarily ignore. Now, some of those some of those features you may want to use, like you might want to use scanless, you might even want to use roaming or some of these other advanced features. Some of them we don't use ever in ham radio. Some of them we rarely use and some of them we occasionally use, but for the normal operator, just ignore it because you just don't need that stuff. It adds more complexity and there's just no kind of no point. So once you, be, once you master the basics, if you want to 
venture into a few of these other things, go for it. But it's, it's rarely ever done. I don't bother with any of those other features myself. So what do you need to do? You need to define your channels, your zones, your settings, your uh, talk groups. And that's about it. So let's take a look uh, here. What you see is um, the, the table of channels. Now, as John mentioned earlier, zones and channels are two different tables. The simplest thing to start with is to say, I'm going to have one zone. It's called zone one or, or whatever, my radio. Have, you have one zone, in other words, one bank of channels, and you, you, you create your channels in this table, and you put them all in that zone. And if I make 15 channels, there's my 15 channels. I'm done. It's that, that simple. You don't need to get very complicated. As soon as you decide that you, you want to set up your radio so it's convenient to say, well, I have one bunch of channels I use at home, and I have a different bunch of channels I use when I'm traveling, then you might create a second zone and decide which channels to go into your travel zone or however you want to organize it. So if you take a look at what goes in every channel, it's pretty basic. I mean, it's kind of like your analog radio. Remember, all you have to do is program in for every channel, the receive and transmit frequency. You have to tell it if it's an analog or digital signal because all of these DMR radios will work FM. There's only a few models that don't do FM and you're probably never gonna use them. So all of the popular radios are FM and uh, DMR. You're going to define what the power output is just like on an analog radio. Uh, you're not going to set your CTCSS or PL tones because you don't use them in digital. And then the last field you'll see there is, is channel name. And this is an arbitrary text field that you can put in there to label it. So like in most radios, you can either look at the channel name or the channel frequency. Um, you could select either one of those things. Um, and then you, what you don't see here is what talk group is selected because it kind of ran off the page. So uh, let's take a little closer look. So let's take, for example, um, when, when I set up my hotspot, I, I use a frequency of 439.3125, uh, somewhat arbitrarily picked. You can pick whatever channel you want. We'll talk about how do you pick a channel in a few minutes. But um, so you'll see there what's highlighted in red is 439.3125 is receive and transmit. I'm in digital mode. My uh, power output on this radio there's low, medium, high, and turbo, <laughs> which I, 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 don't, I don't even know what that means, but it's gotta be better than high because sure. turbo just sounds better. Um, the bandwidth is 12 and a half kilohertz. FM is 25. So you have to set 12 and a half. Uh, PL tones are turned off. And then, um, and then what you see over there is, is the last column is the talk group. And, and the talk group, um, is, uh, is Baynet, uh, and I labeled it uh, as that. And you can see over on my zone table, uh, I have a zone called trail. So for the way I, or I organize my, my zones differently than everybody else, um, of course. So the way I organize it is I organize the channels based on my use case. And my use case is either I'm walking around the house or I'm driving around the Bay Area or I'm on a hiking trail or I'm traveling. Those are kind of the four modes of operation where I want a different set of channels. So, um, so I, have a cha I have a zone that I call trail and that's when I go hiking um, or doing outdoor stuff. Um, I set that up and, uh, and in that zone, I have analog repeaters and digital repeaters and, and some public safety stuff and some simplex channels. So uh, when we talk about this zone organizing, uh, here's, here's the four that I have, home, travel, trail, and public safety. Um, so if there's some some event happens and I want to know like what's up with the uh, local you know fire department or PD or whatever if they're still on analog and there's a dwindling number, then I'll go to the public safety set of channels. If if I'm uh, traveling, I uh, it's mostly hotspots uh, where I have a lot of uh, uh, talk groups set for my hotspots. And when I'm at home, it's a combination of hotspots and repeaters. What some people do with DMR um, is they'll set up their zones so that every zone is a repeater and the channels within the zones are different talk groups. One of the things that is really irritating about DMR is you would think, like with an analog radio, you can set the, in VFO mode, you can set the frequency and you can set the PL tone and you can leave the frequency and set any PL tone or change the frequency and whatever PL tone. There's like two different tables. In the DMR world, there's no such thing as that. 
one channel has the frequency and the talk group. So uh, that blows out the number of channel combinations you need, which is sort of unfortunate, but it's just kind of the way it works. George, if I could just add uh, one more comment on that. Um, for those of you that have like kids or spouses that may be using the same radio, um, a channel not only is unique to those uh, you know, I, uh, tags that George mentioned, but it's also unique to your, to your DMR ID. So if you're sharing a radio and you want to program it to the Baynet repeater, you need to have an entry for your uh, DMR ID and your spouse's or child's ID. And those would take two different channel entries in the, in the table. Yeah, good, good that, point, John. That. Yeah, I, I've been making the assumption that you use your radio and if someone else has one, they use theirs and those are programmed separately. But if you do want to share radios, then it, a lot of the radios will let you have multiple radio IDs also. So you, so you, you, can, you can program it that way like you're describing it. All, the any tone or most of them do that. Um, one of the other tables you'll set up in your in your uh, programming software are the talk groups you're going to use. Now, in the Brandmeister network, I don't know how many there are, but there's thousands of talk groups. Uh, let's say there's a thousand to, for simplicity's sake. Um, the first thing that everybody does is they want to program all thousand talk groups into the radio because you never know when you might want to talk to somebody in Swaziland. So you know, if, that, if that's what you want to do, go for it. I, what I found is that's completely useless <laughs> because I will never use 992 of the talk groups. So it's just in inconvenient. Uh, so what I figured out is at any point in time, there's only like five talk groups that I will ever use, full stop. Now that's just for me. You, you may have a different uh, desire to have a zillion different talk groups, but since you can only listen to one thing at a time, you know, I grew up in a town where we had seven television channels. So for me, having five talk groups is really fine. <laughs> I don't really need a thousand. So I program in my talk group list, I put in uh, our club's talk group, 31075. I put in 310, which is a commonly used uh, simplex talk group. Um, by simplex, I mean over the internet, like, you know, radio to radio, not through a public talk group. 91, which is international, and 3,100, that's North America. Now, there's another, you know, thousand talk groups I could have put in here, but, you know, some of the talk groups are organized by geography, like the Southern California talk group or the, the Chicago talk group. Other talk groups, and there's like, you know, um, regional, state, national, international, that's one way. There's other talk groups that are organized by topic. So you'll find there's like the four wheel drive enthusiast talk group or the, you know, the underwater basket weaving talk group. And, uh, you know, if, that, if, if there's an interest, go for it. Like our talk group 31075 is used for mainly for two things. One is it's our club's talk group mainly used when people are out of the area to link back to the rest of the club. Uh, and a lot, we have a lot of expat uh, club members, you know, guys who move out of California and move to you know, Washington or East Coast or out of the country, and they can still hub back into our talk group. The other thing we use it for is for the Ham Radio Workbench podcast, and we wanted our own talk group. And so since I'm involved with both, I said, let's just use the same talk group. And so it's really uh, used for both um, purposes. So that's, that's, that's why that hub is there. So here's the one big inconvenience about the way the DMR radios are set up. If you have, let's say you, in your area, there are 10 repeaters. And let's just say there are, in the universe of talk groups, there's 10 talk groups you'd ever want to use. You cannot set them independently. It would be good if you can have one like knob that says set the channel and the other knob that says set the talk group, wouldn't it? Well, that would make sense because you want any repeater and any talk group. Well, you can't do that. <laughs> The way the DMR radio works is if you want all of those combinations, you have to have a hundred channels and they have to be explicitly programmed with every RF channel in every talk group is choose up one channel. The good news is most radios can handle hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of channels, but it's kind of a big pain in the neck. So this is why what some people do is they will say, okay, uh, zone one will be the Black Mountain repeater. Zone two will be the Mount Diablo repeater. Zone three will be my hotspot. And then within zone one, the Black Mountain repeater, channel one will be talk group 91. Channel two will be talk group 310. Channel three will be talk group 311. 
so that each repeater gets a zone and every channel in that zone is a different talk group and all the other RF parameters are the same. That's a perfectly logical way to organize your radio. I don't do it that way because I don't need all hundred combinations. I only need like four of them. So I don't bother with that, but, but that's a very popular way to do it. I would recommend before you get into this, what you should do is have one zone and you should program half a dozen channels to talk to your local repeater or hotspot with a couple of talk groups. At the end of the day, that's probably what you're gonna wind up using mostly anyway. And that will simplify your setup of your, of your code plug. Remember what a code plug is? It's your radio configuration file. Hey, George, if I could add one other thing that I'm just thinking that hasn't really been presented. And I think yeah. we're thinking a lot about the, um, the Anytone radios. So when you're actually using an Anytone radio, the zone is the highest level, level of filter. So you, when you're using the Anytone radio, you first need to choose your zone on the radio. And then there's the little spin dial on the top of the radio that takes you across the channels that are programmed into that zone. So if it's easier for you to think of it hierarchically, um, you choose your zone you know, is the, is the first filter and then spin the knob to the channels that are listed in is the second. I yes, that's an excellent point, John. Kind of yeah, that's a really good point. And all radios work that way, not just the Anytone. Uh, that, that's common across all the commercial radios and all the, all, all the radios out there. So here, here's an example of how you might set up your radio. So uh, this kind of follows what you're just saying. So in order there, you can see in zone one, I've got eight channels. And those channels uh, are a combination of, uh, let's say, channel one and channel two are the same repeater. Well, actually, channel one, two, three, and four are all the same repeater. The only difference is a different talk group. So I can talk to talk group uh, 31075, Baynet talk group, 310, which is a tactical talk group, 91, which is international, and th um, 31064, which is the Santa Clara County talk group. Uh, if I go to channel five, this is a different repeater. This is the Loma Prieta repeater on a different RF channel. And then you'll start to see the, the talk groups are repeated. So this is where that combination of channel and talk group kind of multiplies out. Now, like I said, here in the Bay Area, we, we probably do have easily 10 DMR repeaters and I could come up with 10 or 12 talk groups, but I, I don't program hundred plus channels. I program in half a dozen. I, I pick the ones I'm likely to use. Um, so let's talk a little bit about hotspots in the interest of time here. So we, we uh, kind of hit to the wrap up. So what's a hotspot and how does it work? Hotspots are probably the, uh, the thing that got me into digital radios to begin with back in the D-Star days was when um, a good friend of mine showed me his D-Star radio in a hotspot and it completely opened my eyes to the possibility here of being able to haul your network access with you no matter where you are. So normally when you think about talking on the repeater, you think about, I, I have to be in coverage area of the repeater and then I'm gonna share the time with other people and use it you know, when I can. With a hotspot, you have your own access to the network that you completely control. You could decide how you want to use it um, and where you want to use it and whether you want it just at home or in your car or uh, traveling with you. And I, I take my traveling, when, remember travel? <laughs> when we used to do that stuff, uh, I would always take it with me so I can haul my network with me, which is really awesome. So a hotspot is a little box. It's got a small low power transceiver in it. Uh, usually these things are about 10 milliwatts. Uh, they're uh, often UHF. Uh, for the most part, you can get two meter ones as well, but usually UHF. Um, 10 milliwatts is enough to cover your entire house and then some. It's surprisingly uh, good. Uh, I, you'll, you'll be amazed how far you can talk with 10 milliwatts through walls and everything. So the way this works is you talk from your radio to the hotspot, and then the hotspot has an internet connection on the backside of it that goes into the internet and then it pops out somewhere else. Now it could pop out in a, does, the, the destination could be a repeater or it could be a talk group. Most likely it's a talk group, which is really a server in the sky. So um, if, if for example, I go into the house here on my hotspot and I wanna go to talk group 91, um, it connects to talk group 91 and everybody in the world who's connected to talk group 91, I will hear coming out of my hotspot. And when I transmit, they'll all hear me uh, coming from my uh, little hotspot. Yeah. So 
so it, it's, a, it's a great way to get coverage. If you don't have a repeater in your area, it gives you access, obviously. If you do have a repeater in your area, it lets you use your hotspot and not monopolize the repeater. So you can say, I want to tune into the fly fishing talk group and leave it sit there all day. And I don't have to worry about irritating somebody who could care less about that, that discussion. And I could just use my hot, hot spot. Um, I also figured out several years ago when my son was going to college in San Luis Obispo, if I would go down and visit and drive three hours to San Luis Obispo, um, rather than tuning around on the radio to find a repeater, I just put the hotspot in, in the car, connected it to my cell phone, and I had network access on D-Star the whole drive down and the whole drive back, and it was awesome. Um, so, so that was just super, you know, super handy. Uh, when I would travel on business trips, I would take a small handy talkie and a hotspot, throw it in my bag, and now I would have instant network access anywhere in the world. Can I throw another story onto that pile? Sure. So um, back in 2018, I think it was, when I came out to Dayton for the first time to be with you all in the booth, um, I, I did the same thing. I've got a DMR hotspot. I hooked it up to a Raspberry Pi, hooked that up to my cell phone for internet connectivity. And I was on DMR on my drive from San Luis Obispo, California, out to Xenia, Ohio. And I took, I think it was five or six days, and I drove through a bunch of national parks on the way. And visited some folks, met some folks on the DMR talk group. Um, there's one gentleman that uh, we met on 31075 and uh, stopped and had barbecue lunch together just because I was driving through town. And uh, it, it was a wonderful experience. Uh, there was a bit of a wackiness with uh, chargers not working correctly, but I had enough battery in my radio that I was able to get on the talk group talk to some friends, have them order the right things that I needed, have them shipped to one of the houses I was going to be staying at. And it got there in time. And I was able, you know, basically Kirk K6RCT did the guy in the chair for me and got the parts I needed to delivered to where I was going to be to pick them up. And I was uh, charged and ready to go for the rest of the trip. It was a great experience. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. That That's a really, that's a really great story. I mean, th th to me, this is, one of the reasons that this whole DMR thing is so compelling, and you can apply this to D-Star and Fusion to some extent as well, is, is it really extends your, your coverage in your community, it, just like the Cycle 25 hub idea. But this is the two-way radio version of, of that sort of thing where you can haul your connectivity with you. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, just, it's just really exciting. I think it's a great, uh, a great thing. So this is what a hotspot looks like. There's, there's, two, there's many different hotspots out there, and I, I can't show you all of them but these are probably the two most popular. So the, the one on the left is, is an example of, uh, of a MMDVM hotspot. So MMDVM is a, is a body of work that was done by a guy named John, uh, Jonathan Naylor. Uh, I believe it was the developer. He's a, a brilliant guy who wrote a bunch of software uh, that would you'd put on a Raspberry Pi and then attach a little RF transceiver module to it and the whole thing can fit into this little box that's about three inches by an inch by an inch, this tiny little thing. Um, and then some other guys came along and wrote a really fabulous shell uh, web user interface around it. And that's what's called PyStar. So PyStar is a free piece of software you can download. So if you get yourself a Raspberry Pi and one of these little RF uh, modules, uh, you could buy all this stuff off the shelf ready to go for about a hundred bucks. Uh, or you can get the piece parts and cobble it together yourself. And this, this hotspot uh, will allow you to uh, Wi-Fi into the internet. So it could Wi-Fi onto your phone. It could Wi-Fi into your home access point or your work access point or anywhere you can actually log into. Um, and you can set it up to, to hop onto multiple different Wi-Fi uh, access points. And it supports DMR and DSTAR and Fusion and the other digital modes that are not used very much like NXDN and P25. Um, so it's really a fantastic way to go for, for around a hundred bucks. It's really hard to beat. The other model that is super popular is by a company called um, Shark RF. They make a product called the OpenSpot. Uh, there's been OpenSpot one, two, and three. The current model three is that uh, plastic unit on the right-hand side there. Uh, similar capability to the, um, MMDVM hotspots, 
the, the, the big difference with the OpenSpot 3 is it, it, ha it doesn't have a Raspberry Pi. It runs its own software and presents the control interface as a website, which is really uh, incredibly easy to use. It's probably easier to set up an open spot than a PyStar. Uh, PyStar exposes a bazillion um, fields. You have to configure five of them. You just need to know which five. Um, the open spot is a bit more user friendly. The beauty of the open spot three is that it also does transcoding. So let me pause for a moment. If you're going to remember two things out of today, besides how to configure your radio, it's to pay attention to what I'm about to say. With the advent of D-Star Fusion and DMR, we have balkanized the digital radio community. In other words, we built these big silos. D-Star guys are over here, DMR guys are over there. They can't talk to each other, which is probably the biggest single downside to all of this stuff is that we've created these independent silos. The OpenSpot 3 has the ability to transcode between these modes. What that means is, I can, believe it or not, I can take a D-Star handy talkie, transmit into my open spot and come out on the DMR network. I can take my DMR radio, go into the open spot and come out on a D-Star network or a fusion network or an NXDN network or any of these. And the, why is that? It's because there is a codec inside the, or software in, in, codec inside the open spot that converts the coding between one system and another. It turns out that Fusion and DMR use the same codec, so that's not a big uh, magical thing, but DSTAR is different. And, and so this and that enables you to bridge between DSTAR, DMR, and Fusion networks. So like if you just buy an ICOM 705, which is a fabulous little piece of radio, and it's perfect, except you wanna talk on DMR, well, you get one of these things and now you can switch over. You can, you can just convert in the fly, as well as stay within the network. Obviously, you can go into DMR and come out DMR and just do that if you want. So the only downside to this thing is it's not 100 bucks, it's 300 bucks. So it's also the most expensive uh, uh, hotspot you can buy. Um, however, what, what the way I look at it is it's like this universal translator that, that gives you so many more options that um, and a beautiful user interface. And so I, I highly recommend it if you can afford them. Um, I would get that for sure. If, if that's too much money and you're dipping your toe in the water, and if you're going to stay on one network anyway, then you might as well get the MMDVM because it works great. Um, it's a perfectly fine option. Uh, by the way, also the Shark RF does have a built-in battery. So for travel purposes, that's kind of handy. You can get a day's worth of use out of that with its built-in battery. Uh, okay, next thing I want to touch on is uh, frequencies. How do you pick a frequency? Now, I have heard many people just randomly pick a frequency like, oh, let's use 5.2 <laughs> for their hotspot. <laughs> they should be filleted in public. That's really inappropriate. Um, now, legally, could you do that? Sure. Is that the polite thing to do? Of course not. My, my, in my opinion, you should not use any of these digital radios on any channels which are normally used for FM voice. It's just polite. Why? Because as a digital user, you won't hear them, but they'll certainly hear you when you key up and you're gonna blow their ears out. And it's just rude. So I, I suggest do not use normal FM channels for, uh, for DMR so, or, or D-Star or Fusion. So what frequencies should you use? And we're talking about for hotspots here, not repeaters. So in, uh, in every part of the country in, in the United States, there's a coordination council. They all have their own band plans. So you really have to look at your own local coordinating body and find out, do they have hotspot frequencies reserved, in which case use one of those? Or maybe they have a subband which is designated as uh, mixed use or experimental or digital or something like that. So here in Northern California, for example, on UHF, they identified what they refer to as mixed experimental. They do not have uh, uh, hotspot frequencies designated. So the best advice is you should use these mixed experimental subbands uh, like 145.5 to 145.6 or 433.6 to 434.8 or 438.45 to 55. Anywhere in there is fine because you're going to find other random cats and dogs of different experiments happening and you're not going to bother anybody and they probably won't bother you. Um, if you go out of Northern California, like, oh, into Canada, 
let's say, and for all I know, this is in different provinces, but I don't know. Uh, when I did a little bit of research, I found that um, there are somewhat similar but different subbands that are uh, called out as digital modes in Canada, uh, which might be appropriate for uh, hotspots. So check with your local coordinating body to figure out if that's really the right frequency range. Now, frankly, these things are putting out 10 milliwatts. Are you really going to irritate somebody if you land on an inappropriate frequency? Hey, George, maybe, maybe so this, is, this is Pat. So, you know, it's only 10 milliwatts, but it hadn't happened in a while, but the satellites were really, the FM satellites were really getting uh, killed by some of these DMR hotspots. And so it's only 10 milliwatts, but it can have a wide footprint put in the wrong place. Yeah, that's a good point, Pat. And it, absolutely, for sure, you should steer clear from the satellite subbands. I mean, that that that's an absolute for sure. But, you know, even if you're, even if you're, um, on a non-satellite subband, you know, like if you just hop on 446 simplex, it just seems rude because someone else is going to be trying to use FM on that channel. So, yeah. so not only know, that, keep in mind if you're if you're talking about this as a mobile hotspot, if you've got it in your car, now your footprint of annoyance just grew by yeah. your, you know, it's no longer the small circle of 10 milliwatts around you. It's the swath of that small circle that you drag behind you as you drive around. Yeah, it, well, and also, Mark, if you're in your car and you're using your mobile radio, the lowest power you're going to put out of your mobile radio is probably 5 or 10 watts. And so now you're putting out 5 or 10 watts of digital on those channels because that's as low as it's going to go. Uh, the other thing you might do is operate simplex um, out in the field, and, and you're going to run higher power. So anyway, it's just it's just polite to, to pick a proper subband. Um so let's let's kind of wrap up with with a little bit of um, actually uh, before we get off of the topic of hotspots, can I bring up one additional issue about sure. uh, uh, the way hotspots operate? You bet. They are half duplex, or what in in the ham world what we call simplex. They do not they cannot listen and talk at the same time, which means when you're using a hotspot, when the hotspot is transmitting to you, it can't tell that you're trying to key up the hotspot. So there are, you know, kind of the squelch tail, if you will, on an FM repeater, the some amount of time after the, uh, the, you know, the other person you're talking to unkeys, the repeater continues to transmit for a while. You cannot key up the repeater during that time. It will not be able to hear you because it's transmitting at that time. Yeah, that's an excellent point. So these two hotspots here, this MMDVM hotspot on the left for a hundred bucks and the, R, the Shark RF are exactly what Mark described. Uh, if you shop around, you you can actually find du uh, full duplex MMDVM hotspots for a bit more money, uh, but they're most people don't use them. So so what Mark described is, is like 99% of the time the experience you'll have unless you specifically go get a uh, a hotspot which will operate in duplex. They they actually put duplexers in there. I mean, it's only 10 no, okay, so, so duplexers not going to be that hard. Yeah, or are you talking? Dual so band. they well, so what they do is they they put in two radios, and they put two antenna connectors, and and you have two oh, little yeah. antennas. Now, ten milliwatts is probably and and what you're going to do is you're gonna you're gonna run split uh, frequency like at least a five meg offset on UHF. So will the ten milliwatts desense the receiver at five megs away? Not much. So if you're in the same room, you know, pretty close to it, you'll you'll be able to overcome it, no problem. But uh, it, so what some people do is actually they take these MMDVM uh, duplex hotspots and they stick them up on a pole. And now you get really net neighborhood wide coverage. So um, anyway, it, it, here's, here's my advice. If you're the typical operator, uh, just use one of these simplex or, ha or half duplex uh, hotspots, that's fine. But if you are often changing between talk groups uh, that are very chatty, you're gonna go crazy. <laughs> unless you have a, a full duplex hotspot. And, and by the way, when you program your radio, you have to have a different receive and transmit frequency as opposed to be on the same frequency with these. So um, I, I would only do, that's like an advanced uh, you know, project to go do that someday. I'd start with one of these and, and just follow like what Mark was saying, those guidelines and you'd be fine. Um, okay, so last little bit here. Um, let's just talk about how we use the radios in a couple of scenarios. So. Um, What's the difference between the ham radio world and commercial? This is when I said, why, why does, why is this DMR radio work the way it does? It's because it wasn't built for you. <laughs> so get over that. 
<laughs> it was built for the dog catcher and the, tra the trash truck people. So on ham radio, everything's a party line. Everybody wants to hear what's going on on the channel. In the DMR world, that's not the case because you have multiple different groups of users that are sharing the same frequency and you don't want to hear the other guy's traffic. You only want to hear the traffic that's designed for you to listen to. Um, so that's just kind of the way it is. Um, ham radio world, everybody's a super user. You can configure your radio, do whatever you want. In the commercial world, the goal is to simplify the radio user experience as much as possible because, you know, how many variables do you want to have the dog catcher have access to? On and off and channel, <laughs> maybe volume. That's it. You don't want any more degrees of freedom than that. So these radios make it difficult by and large, uh, unless they've been specifically kind of redesigned for the ham world. Okay, so let's talk about some use cases. We talked about this at the very beginning. It, you could use these radios for simplex. They're not just for repeaters. You can go out you know, on field day and coordinate with your buddies or go on a mountaintop and, and workstations. Uh, and as we mentioned before, you just have to have the radios configured to be exactly the same. Same frequency, same time slot, same color code, same talk group, and now you're all talking together. And quite frankly, it could be any of those parameters. And if, as long as they're all set the same, the radios will talk to each other. Okay, the next scenario is, let's say you're talking through a repeater. When you're accessing the repeater, what do you have to set? You have to set the repeater's frequency. You have to set the time slot. You have to set the color code. Those three uh, parameters are all uh, all need to be correctly set in order to access the repeater. If any one of those three things are not set properly, you will not access the repeater and get what you want done. The, the fourth parameter, the talk group, is what defines where your signal goes once it gets into the repeater. Now, if you are talking into a, a repeater with your buddies and you're not going into the internet, as long as you agree on a talk group, then you'll talk to each other. So for example, you'll often see talk group two or nine or something like that as the local talk group. What that means is, is that the five of us will all program our radio on the repeater frequency, the same color code, the same time slot, and we'll agree on, for example, talk group number two. And as long as we're all in the same talk group, we'll go in and out of the repeater and everybody will hear everybody on that talk group. And it won't go into the internet because that talk group doesn't go anywhere. It stays on the repeater. If you select a different talk group like 31075, it will gateway out of the repeater, in addition to local communications, it will gateway to the internet and it will go to a server that's hosting talk group 3105's hub. And anybody else on the planet who's pointed to 31075's hub will be party lined together. So in, in that case here, you'll see there's, there's two different users. The repeater access is different. So the blue guy and the green guy have different repeater access parameters but the talk groups are the same. So as long as the talk groups are the same, those repeaters will talk to the same talk group in the internet. This is super simple and very fundamental. John, go ahead. Yeah, I have a question about this use case and it goes back to the comment you had earlier where you referenced that um, the Baynet repeater is like locked to a Baynet, you know, to 31075. And what I was looking for clarification, is that a time slot that's locked to the bayonet repeater? Like one of the time, or, okay, so see you shaking your head, no. So if I look at this picture, what I would infer from this is I can take my handy talkie, I can hit the bayonet repeater, and I can have that repeater go out to any talk group on the internet, right? I can choose anyone, right? Is on there, the Brandmeister there, network, yes. On the Brandmeister network, right? There's there's no way, there, there's no time slot that has, that is that the bayonet repeater is locked to to always be three one zero seven five. In the Brandmeister network, in the Brandmeister network, the talk groups are not locked to a to a time slot. Um, you can be you can you can go into either time slot with any talk group, and it will connect to the internet on that talk group. The gentleman's okay. agreement is to please only use three one zero seven five on time slot two and do whatever you want on time slot one. But that's a request. That's there's no technical way to manage okay. that in our okay. in our network. The, the main point that I wanna get across with this slide is when you're connecting uh, users going into two different repeaters, the frequency and the time slot and the color code are only necessary to light up the local repeater. That data does not transmit it over the internet. So in other words, 
my repeater access on color code one and your repeater access on color code seven is only necessary to get into your local repeater. That data doesn't go anywhere else. That just allows you to connect to the repeater. The, the thing that actually goes across the network is the talk group number. And, and so what happens is when you go into the repeater, the repeater says, okay, you're, I, I see the carrier on the right frequency. I see you're on time slot two, and that's, that's fine. I see color code one, which is what I'm set up for. So I will allow your signal to enter the repeater. Then it looks at the, at the talk group and says, okay, you want talk group 31075. That is a certain IP address in the internet. I now point my internet connection to that talk group number and I establish the connection. If I'm user number two in a different city going into a different repeater on a different RF carrier with a different time slot, with a different color code, that repeater B says, okay, user B now has access to me. Oh, you want to route to talk group 31075? And it points its repeater to 31075, that, that um, server. And so that's, that's what makes the connection. So you don't have to have the same color code or the same time slot or anything in terms of the network connection. It's only to access the repeater. And it's that talk group that defines the connectivity. So when you think about it, at first it's like, what? <laughs> but when you think about it, it's really, really simple. You think about it is I just need to set these parameters to get in the repeater. And then my routing is only defined by this, this talk group number. Now, one difference between DSTAR and DMR. On DSTAR, you have a notion of connect and disconnect. On DSTAR, you set up your channel to connect to what's called a reflector, the equivalent of a talk group server. You make the connection and then you switch to CQ mode and now you have your conversation. And when you're done after gassing on for an hour and you wanna disconnect from that talk, that, that hub, you send the unconnect command and now you're disconnected. In DSTAR, it works differently. In DSTAR, every time you transmit, you're transmitting that talk group number. And when you transmit that talk group number, you're switched to that talk group at that instant. The next time someone transmits in your repeater with a different talk group, it switches to a different server, a different talk group, and you're disconnected automatically. Uh, and now you're pointed at a different one. So this is, this is the infuriating mode in, D in DMR. Let's say I'm going into my local repeater on talk group 31075, and John's in, in Minnesota at his cabin going into his hotspot on 31075, and we're chit-chatting away, talking about ice fishing. We're having a grand old time. And then, then uh, Mark is, is here in the Bay Area, and he, it, he's on the same repeater that I'm on, and Mark goes, I don't hear any traffic, and because he, he's had his radio for talk group 91, the international talk group. When Mark presses the pickle, the repeater hears his signal and says, oh, you wanna to talk to talk group 91. It disconnects me from 31075 and points me to 91. And now Mark is listening to traffic on talk group 91. And I'm sitting there thinking like, what happened to John? Where did he go? And I don't know. All I know is like, he's gone. And until I realize I see traffic on the repeater but I don't hear anything. Someone must have switched me. So then I key up on 31075 I switch the repeater now to 31075. I'm now back talking to John about ice fishing. And Mark's thinking like, what the hell happened to the guy in London? I don't know where he went. So this is the thing about DMR that drives people nuts. Because if you have people using different talk groups on the same uh, time slot on the same repeater, they'll be switching back and forth. Now, if you think about it for a minute, if you're the city of San Jose and the dog catcher is talking to the dog catchers in one minute, and then the garbage truck guy is talking to the garbage truck guys in the next minute, this makes perfect sense. It's not ham friendly. So this is the one thing that makes DMR not, well, one of a few things that makes it not ham friendly, but it's just the way it works. You could also say that it's actually an advantage in that I, unlike DMR, I don't have to connect and then go to CQ and then unlink. And I don't have to do any of that nonsense. All I do is set the channel and press the button and I'm talking on, the, on that circuit. Um, so in a way it's DMR is simpler to operate than DSTAR, but you, you may find that you get connected and disconnected when you didn't expect it. That's only a problem if you have a lot of users in your area. Reason number two why hotspots are awesome because yeah. you can totally control your destiny <laughs> while you're using right. your hotspot. So, so George, then the, the bottom line is that a, that a DMI radio should not come without a hotspot. I, honestly, Jim, I, I would always recommend getting a hotspot. Yeah. Always. 
Mm. Because for a hundred bucks, it's going to be the best hundred bucks you ever spend in a ham radio. Right. It's no doubt so, about it. So the, the frequency time slot color code, that's basically a hardware interface or hardware settings for the radio to the internet. Then, it, then the talk group after that becomes basically a software address. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Rod, you had a question? Yeah, I did. Uh, thanks. Uh, George, the, when would you do a disconnect, the, the talk group 4000 type disconnect? Uh, that's a good question. Um, generally speaking, you, you don't bother. Um, for the most part, you really don't have to. I'll, I'll tell you why. Um, there, one thing I didn't get into is there's a notion that talk groups are static or dynamic. So let's. T I've been describing essentially dynamic talk groups, which is generally what you tend to operate. When you set up your repeater, as a repeater owner, you could decide if if all talk groups are dynamic or there's some static ones. So what does that mean? A dynamic talk group. The way that the, what I just described is a dynamic talk group. So when you turn on your radio in the morning, you listen to the repeater, you don't hear anything. It's not connected to anything. It's in its reset condition. Nothing is connected. Um, and and I key up on talk group 91, the international talk group. As soon as I key up, the repeater goes, oh, you want 91? It connects the repeater to the international talk group. So I press the pickle and let go, and I hear guys chatting away in, on the, on the, in the network. There's a timer that's set. Every time I unkey, a timer is refreshed. I have 15 minutes to go until that timer times out. For the next 15 minutes, I will hear any traffic on talk group 91. If after 15 minutes, I don't key up, that talk group will automatically disconnect. So you don't need to do a disconnect. It'll disconnect for you after 15 minutes and that's not programmable. That's just the way it works. How so, about, how, oh, how about with a hotspot? Well, with a hotspot, um, then you can switch to whatever talk group you wanna leave it on when you're idling. If you wanna disconnect and it has a disconnect command of 4,000, you could do that and, and disconnect it if you want to. Um, well Oh, the, the reason I ask is in my, uh, in my sort of fooling around and trying to get to know DMR some, it seems like if I'm through the hotspot connected to a, uh, let's say, uh, uh, 3100, and then I want to go to 93, uh, talk group 93, uh, the hotspot still sort of linked into 3100. But you're, when, what you're saying is when I key up on 93, then that'll switch the hotspot. Yeah. Now, so, so this is the way most of them work. And, and there's, there's a lot of brands of radios and there's a lot of different hotspot kind of software configurations. And you could probably set it differently. But the way most of them work is, is if, if I'm on 91 and I want to switch to 3100, as soon as they stop talking, back to Mark's point about, you know, I have to wait till they drop their carrier before right. I can get in. Right. Once they stop talking to take a breath and I press the button to switch to 3100, it'll just switch. I don't have to disconnect and reconnect. Ah, oh, okay. Good, good to know. <laughs> so in, in D-Star, like if you go into an ICOM D-Star repeater, you have to link and then you chat with CQ and then you unlink before I can link to a different reflector. Right. In, in hotspots for D-Star, they have dynamic linking where you can, you don't have to unlink, you, you, like you can just go in and, and connect, connect, connect and bop around. Uh, you don't need to disconnect. So it depends on how the, the target device was, uh, how the code was written. Yeah. So, okay. so in DMR, you don't, you don't need to disconnect. I suppose if you want to idle the hotspot and have it plugged in, but not connected, you could do that. I don't ever bother with that. I just leave it on whatever the last node or a hot um, talk group was that I talked on. Or I might default it back to 31075 or something like that. Just leave it there. Okay. So this key up to connect to a talk group is why you hear so many Kurt chunks on popular talk groups. That's right. Yep. Uh, okay, so let me just wrap up uh, with a couple other slides, then we'll we'll take any questions if anybody's still listening. <laughs> okay, so so now comes the fun part. Let's go spend some money. <laughs> there. There are a plethora of radios to choose from out there, and uh, I, I won't attempt to catalog them because there's a million of them. Um, so let me let me just make a few recommendations here for radios that that I own that I think are good radios. So if you look in the um, in in more of the amateur targeted market, 
the uh, Anytone radios have become super popular. They're probably the most popular brand these days. They're built to be commercial radios. They weren't built for hams, but they discovered that hams are buying them by the by the bucket. So they're very popular. The Anytone uh, 578 is a very popular mobile, mobile radio. Um, I've got one of these. It, it's, a, it's a good radio. Uh, the 878 is a super popular handy talkie. Uh, I love the fact that it comes with Bluetooth. And I've connected my radio to the Bluetooth in the car. I've connected it to earbuds. I've connected it to all kinds of stuff. So that's really awesome. Um, uh, the, everybody promotes Bridgecom as a, as a dealer. Uh, Bridgecom does an outstanding job of, of providing educational material and support for the radios. And I would, I would recommend, if you go to Amazon and buy one, uh, they actually get uh, mostly get sold through Bridgecom. Um, so I, I'd buy it from them because they'll give you good support. Uh, another radio that I've played with of late is, uh, is this um, uh, Radiodity. Um, it's, it's the same as this TYT MD430. This is called like a G... 73 or something like that. Um, this radio is uh, smaller and does not have a detachable antenna. It's a simpler radio. It doesn't have as fancy display. Um, why in the world would you bother with something like this? Not just because it's cheaper, but um, when the 878 is too big and bulky, this guy is a little bit smaller. <laughs> now, the nice thing about this guy is if you're traveling, for me, I like a really lightweight, small travel radio. And this is a great travel radio because you're mostly talking to your hotspot anyway. Um, it is uh, PC programmable, as all of these are, and it has a USB, uh, micro USB charger. So you don't need a separate charging cradle for this thing. So it's one less thing to carry in your luggage. So I think this makes a spectacular travel radio. Uh, I also like it um, if I'm doing, like if I'm going on a trail uh, and I don't want to carry much. And, and if I drop it and step on it, I kind of don't really care. This makes for a great disposable radio uh, and works really well. It's very loud. Um, but if I were going to have one radio, then I would get, bump it up to this 878 for a two, two and a quarter. Uh, you you kind of can't beat it. Um, the other option is to get um, uh, used radios. Um, well, you can buy them new if you want, but you can buy some really nice quality used Motorola radios. Um, the uh, XPR 5550s are great mobile radios. That's what I have in my car. Uh, the XPR 7550 is a very deluxe um, radio. They have a beautiful Bluetooth microphone that you can get to go with it. Uh, or the real deal is the older XPR uh, 6550s. You can buy these for between uh, 150, 100 to 200 bucks. And you're getting an old radio, but you find one where the guys replaced the case with a brand new case. So it looks like it just came out of the box because the case did. And um, they work really, really well. Now, the downside to the Motorola radios is that they don't have some of these extended features uh, that the Anytones do. So you really get more bang for your buck with an Anytone radio. But some people um, think that um, you know, a Motorola radio is, gives you some extra swagger or something. And if you want to play with them, go for it. Um, they are very good. The, the 5550 has a detachable head, which is why I use it in the car. So I put the radio in the trunk, and I put the control head in the front. And it has a front firing speaker, so it makes a very convenient radio. Um, if you do go with Motorola, you have to get the Motorola programming software, which is not the easiest thing in the world. It doesn't, it, it's not intended for consumers. So you have to um, get the software and then you have to get a uh, access code to be able to program your radio. Uh, however, Motorola uncharacteristically doesn't throw a fit when people use this software. So normally when you buy the commercial two-way Motorola radios, you have to buy the RSS, the programming software, you can't resell it. Um, with the DMR, the RSS software, the CPS software, they call it, is actually free. But to unlock like wideband FM that we need, you have to have a code. Um, I, I went through the necessary, necessary training and bureaucratic nightmare of getting a bank of codes. So if anybody's dying to program their Motorola radio, let me know and I could probably get you a code legitimately. Uh, so it's not like some, you know, behind the 7-Eleven deal. This is actually legitimate code uh, because I registered our club as a legit user with a bank of codes. So uh, we can help you with that. Um, so all these are good. Your, your favorite radio may not be on the list here, but you can't go wrong with these, these radios. Um, if you don't think this is enough and you really want to dwell on this at, at length, we did a whole a series of two episodes on the podcast 
One of them focused on user basics and the other focused on network basics. And um, each episode is a couple of hours. So there's about four or five hours of content. Only two episodes? To. Only, yeah. Well, it's pushed in six hours of materials. <laughs> and it but comes anyway, up regularly. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it does feel like several episodes by the time you're halfway through. So that's it. Um, so hopefully that wasn't too much to scare everybody off. No, I think that was excellent. Thank you. Um, really appreciate it. I think we should probably open it up for a couple of questions. And uh, for before I do that, for anybody that's listening to this on YouTube, um, keep in mind that we do this on a regular basis. Uh, we do record. We've got about five recordings that are going to be posted by the time you see this up here. Um, and we do... Uh, we will be setting up a, a site to post some of these materials as well. So keep that one in mind. So anybody in the group with any questions for George? John. If I could just add real quick, and I apologize, I got to run to a meeting, but one of the things uh, maybe we'll talk about on a future session is somebody who struggles to memorize um, calls, right? What's really neat about DMR, the thing George briefed over is this contact list. And there's a large directory that's on site uh, online that allows you to download the entire user space, if you will, of those numbers followed by their names and locations. And so it's really nice. And again, I think it's on a lot of radios, but on the AnyTone, when someone presses the pickle, not only do you see, you know, you can control whether or not you see their DMR ID, but you can see their call, their name, their location, which is really nice. Um, and you don't have to like struggle to try to remember what this guy's call is. So. Um, anyhow, a great presentation, George. Thank you. Thanks, John. So just to add to what John was saying, like what, one thing that makes DSTAR and Fusion more ham friendly is you register your, your call sign in the radio. And when you transmit, the radio transmits your actual call sign. In DMR, uh, as I mentioned before, it transmits your ID number. So um, what you can do, like John was saying, is you, could, you can get this big list of, of IDs and load it in your radio. Some radios are very limited on the number of contacts they can store. Um, so some of them are as limited as like, like less than a thousand uh, or even less than that. The radios that are, that are targeting the ham market like the, the Anytone radios can store several thousand. So you can, uh, I think today that like the DMR contact list is like a couple hundred thousand IDs. And I think you can store most of them, maybe all of them, even in the current model of the AnyTone. So uh, what happens is when you transmit, you transmit your seven digit ID, the radio then looks that ID up inside the radio and then presents the data that was loaded into it from the database. It doesn't actually transmit that information over the air. And what that also means is that over time that data gets stale. So if I load that contact table today and uh, let's say tomorrow, John gets his new call sign uh, it, it, he won't be in there. <laughs> His old call will be in there. I have to go to the database, download the database and re-upload it into my radio. So if you really want to be current, you kind of have to do that every you know, couple of months or whatever, however frequently you want to update it. If you're talking to the same guys all the time or people that have been around a long time, you don't have to do it because their number's already in there. But anybody who, who has a new radio ID won't be there unless you upload that, that set of data. Okay. And with that, I think I'm going to shut down the live stream. Uh, thank you so much, George. I really appreciate uh, you taking time for this. This is a fantastic presentation. Um, yeah, absolutely. And thank you so much. My pleasure, Rod. Thanks, everybody.